So great to be in church on Resurrection Sunday. Well, the title of today's message is Waiting for Suddenly. And uh, it's not actually the message I wanted to preach. Uh, In my own imagination and my own uh, intellect and thinking, I had two really great ideas. I know, of Resurrection Sunday messages. And I told them to God. And uh, he reminded me that the basis of any great message is prayer and the word. I know, groundbreaking stuff. And so as I went to prayer and the word to begin to prepare, it became very clear to me that the Lord was asking me to leave aside my own dreams of these beautifully crafted messages and uh, preach out of the resurrection. I mean, obviously I was going to do that. I wasn't, you know, going to go somewhere else really weird, but... All of that to say, I believe that God's message to us through me today is for today. And so if you're here with us in the room or if you're joining us online or maybe even connecting later, um, I believe this word is from God to you through me as the conduit. And so we're going to start before Resurrection Sunday because in the Bible we're going to take a bit of a backtrack to Friday because I've always been taken because I've got a great imagination. I've always been taken by that period of time that elapsed between three o'clock on Friday afternoon and dawn on Sunday morning, that first Easter weekend. And uh, if you know the story, Jesus has come into Jerusalem, uh, celebrated just the week before his death. And then there's been a whole lot of unfortunate events that didn't go the way that people thought they were going to go. They thought he was being welcomed as king. He finds himself before a trial and being convicted of a crime he didn't commit and then being sentenced to death by crucifixion, death on a cross with some common criminals. And as he's hung there on the cross, it says in Matthew 27 at verse 50, then Jesus shouted out again and he released his spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, just so that we would know that it wasn't done by man, just so that we would know that it could only have been done by God, the the curtain at that very moment that Jesus gave his breath, his last breath and released his spirit, the curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, rocks split apart and tombs opened. And it goes on to say, and many women who had come from Galilee with Jesus to care for him were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Then if we go over to the Luke account, because who knows that Matthew, Mark, Luke and John are four different accounts of the same events of Jesus' life. And I read all four of them uh, this week in preparation, just about the, the uh, Jesus' death and uh, resurrection. And I was shocked once again by how similar the accounts all were, especially when it comes to the words of Jesus. So over in Luke 23, it says, But Jesus' friends including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching. Now, there was a good and righteous man named Joseph. He was a member of the Jewish high council, but he had not agreed with the decision and actions of the other religious leaders. That was the actions to crucify Jesus. He was from the town of Arimathea in Judea, and he was waiting for the kingdom of God to come. He went to Pilate, that's the ruler, and asked for Jesus' body. Then he took the body down from the cross and wrapped it in a long sheet of linen cloth and laid it in a new tomb that had been carved out of rock. This was done late on Friday afternoon, the day of preparation, as the Sabbath was about to begin. Because what's important here is that the Jewish Sabbath, the law that had been established by Moses all those generations earlier and established as a permanent law, meant that from sunset on Friday for the following 24 hours, it was a God-ordained command to rest, 
to not work. And so Friday leading up to sunset is a day of preparation for the Sabbath, the preparation for rest. I mean, I take a Sabbath once a week these days and I have to prepare for it. I have to have a day of preparation so that who knows, mum's in the room, in order to take a day of rest, lots of preparation is required, lots of organisation. And so we are at the day of preparation, getting things ready to be able to rest. I mean, what in the world taking a day of rest when the person we have all our hopes and dreams in for the fulfilment of all of God's promises has just been crucified. And yet God is asking us to rest in the waiting. As his body was taken away, the women from Galilee followed and saw the tomb where his body was placed. Then they went home and prepared spices and ointments to anoint his body. But by the time they were finished, the Sabbath had begun. So they rested as required by the law. They were still following the commands of God, even in the waiting. If we go back to Matthew 27, it says, Both Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting across from the tomb and watching. They were watching and waiting, watching and waiting. What was going to happen next? If I put myself in their shoes, I can't understand what it must have been like to be commanded to spend 24 hours immediately after the death of my Saviour, resting and waiting and watching to see what would happen next. For me, today marks seven months of watching and waiting in my own life, watching and waiting on God. If you've followed along with our sabbatical story, and I've put a code up here on the screen so that this, these stories will make more sense to you if you catch up on our sabbatical story episodes. It's a podcast that we made last year after having our first ever sabbatical last year, Luke and I. You, if you listen to that, and I know many of you have, you'll hear in detail the process Luke and I have been on over the past year as we planned for our first ever sabbatical and then took it in July and August last year. And uh, we took that time as an intentional rest from day-to-day activity to seek God's face about our next seven-year period of productivity as as a husband and wife, as parents of our children, as ministers in the local church, as people with big hopes and dreams, we wanted to seek God first about where he would direct our steps for the next seven years cycle of our productivity. What, what would we put our energy into, our effort, our time, our money? What, what would we be dreaming about? And so toward the end of that sabbatical rest period in July and August last year, we began to have a clearer picture of where we believed God was leading us for the next seven years. And so we began to take steps in the direction we believed he was leading us because we'd seen signs and wonders and miracles like we sang about today, confirming that the path we were on was blessed by God. But then some things started to shake our confidence because things weren't going smoothly or quickly. Time was passing and problems weren't immediately being resolved. Deadlines were coming and then passing and the things we'd been dreaming about starting for this year, 2024, just didn't seem to be getting any closer. In the midst of all that, that was a lot going on in my heart and mind, Uh, towards the end of last year, I started seeking God for a word for this year for my life, for me personally. I know we cast vision as a whole church and our vision for this year is our feast, but I wanted to seek God for a word just for my year. And on Monday, December 18 last year, seven days before Christmas, I came across a prophetic word from Christine Kane, which she'd written directed toward church leaders. And I'm going to read it out to you. Just bear with me. This is what she said. I feel so strongly that we are literally on the edge of a move of God unlike anything I've ever seen in my lifetime. It's been a brutal decade. 
Everything that can be shaken has been shaken, so that those things that cannot be shaken shall remain. We've all had so much loss, so much betrayal, so much disappointment, so much confusion, so much disillusionment. But it's a new day. God is doing a new thing. He is forging new wine skins for new wine. I sense that some of you are about to see your suddenly. This is your moment of breakthrough. You will literally no longer care what they think, what they are doing or what they are saying. A new courage, boldness and confidence in Christ is about to overcome you. Doors slammed shut are about to open. Promotion is about to happen. The mouths of lions are about to be shut. Your God is about to reward you in public for what you've endured faithfully in private. It's redemption time. But the thing that stood out from that message to me personally, which I really believed God dropped in my spirit, was the word suddenly. And just as I read it, I didn't even really take a lot of notice of the rest of that message, except that the word suddenly jumped out at me. And immediately I thought, this is the word God is giving me for 2024. I didn't think much more about it that day. But the next day as I was getting up, this is the Tuesday and starting my day, I quickly did a word search in the Bible app because I said to God, if I'm going to adopt this word suddenly as my word for the year, I'm going to want to anchor it in Scripture because that's who I am. I'm going to want to have it anchored in God's word. So I quickly did a word search in my Bible app to see if a verse came up which resonated with me and would confirm my choice of the word suddenly as the banner over my year. And the first verse which appeared from my word search was this one from Acts 16. It says, Suddenly there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. It just felt so right. And especially for me personally, I just felt like God was speaking to me personally because the word I'd chosen for last year was the word free. And I'd been holding on to a belief and a hope that God would use my life to help bring freedom from captivity and bondage in thinking to other people. And this just seemed to be like the next step of that belief. So I walked into my day, Tuesday, the 19th of December, 2023, feeling completely confident that God had given me the word suddenly as the banner for 2024 for my year. And this verse from Acts 16 about suddenly there was a massive earthquake as my anchor verse. Anyway, I went about my day. And while I was at work that day, I suddenly received a phone call. And uh, it was... Jessica Hamilton's name who came up on my phone and I thought that's not good news because I love Jessica Hamilton but she was away camping with my daughter Zara and I thought if Zara needed to contact me she would contact me herself if she was able to. Sure enough when I answered the phone it was not Jessica Hamilton it was Jason Hamilton And my spirits sunk even further. I thought, whatever this is, it's serious enough that not even Jessica can be the bearer of bad news. It's going to be Jason. And sure enough, Jason adopted his best calming teacher voice and quietly informed me that Zara had indeed recently had a fainting episode and we think she may have hit her head on the way to the ground and there's some conjecture that there might have been some seizure-like activity and we're sure everything's going to be okay but we just wanted to let you know and see what you would like us to do next. And I was saying, God, I am not in the business of having bad suddenlies over my year. That's not what I was hoping for. I was quite concerned, obviously. Camp Elam is a two-hour drive from here. 
And uh, the worst part about the whole thing, if you're a mom or dad in the room, you would maybe know if you've had one of these phone calls before. The worst part is not being able to be there and see with your own eyes if your kid is okay. I was quite concerned. However, the, the details of what had happened were so similar to the details of another phone call that I'd had the year before from the school. That's also never a bad and never a good phone call when the school's number comes up on your phone. And there were several missed calls because they were coming at the time we were conducting a funeral service here at church. Luke and I both finished the funeral service. We both have multiple missed phone calls from the school. And they say, we just want to let you know, we think everything's okay. Don't panic. But your son, Max, has been hit in the head by a door. And we, I mean, what? We believe that he's... Uh, maybe he's passed out, but we believe he's maybe shown some seizure-like activity. And we've called the ambulance and perhaps you better, we'll let you know whether you should come to the school or come to the hospital. The details were so similar and it was the week leading up to Christmas and I just said, darkness, you have no hold over me. I just started saying, tell the devil no, not today, while I was still quite concerned. What happened next, I, could, I can only read to you from my journal from Wednesday, the 20th of December, as I sought to process these events. Here's what I wrote Wednesday, the day after. So I reluctantly hit the road. I'd agreed to meet, meet Jenny Hamilton halfway. The ambulance came by the way. You're all left hanging. What's happening? They called the ambulance. The ambulance were okay to pass her into my care, put her under supervision. So me and Jenny made a plan. We're going to meet at the rock servo, the old rock servo, and I'll bring her home. So I reluctantly hit the road. I was already pretty tired after an emotionally draining day. And I wasn't really looking forward to driving for almost an hour and a half and then turning straight around and driving the same distance back home again. But as I came over the Hexham Bridge heading north, my concern about tiredness took a back seat to concern about the dark storm I could see I was heading straight into. This is the day that verse came up on my Bible app that morning. There have been crazy storms around further north of us this past week. And I could see a very dark sky and growing lightning patterns in my immediate future. I think I began praying out loud when I still had about 34 kilometres to get to my meeting point destination. I mean, I was literally saying the name of Jesus over and over again and praying for protection from this storm. I was so scared as I navigated whether I was better off to keep driving or to try and pull over and wait it out, except that it felt like I was right in the eye of the storm. I was crawling along the highway at under 70 kilometres an hour in a 110 kilometre an hour zone, just maintaining a distance behind the car in front of me for the sake of visibility but the lightning was striking all around me and the thunder was right on top of each lightning strike. I think it was at the point of the car electrical system shorting out and telling me it was unresponsive that I decided to pull over. Within the next couple of minutes, every car and truck along the Pacific Highway was pulled over to the side of the road and no cars kept driving. I'd never seen anything like it, being on the Pacific Highway and every single vehicle was pulled over to the side of the road. That's how severe the storm was and that's how frightened I was. My journal goes on to remind me that in the midst of that sudden storm, I was also receiving a phone call from Luke about some of the financial preparation work we had been doing for those few months since our sabbatical, which was supposed to be setting us up financially for the next seven years. And he was telling me it had suddenly gone sideways. I was so frightened that I couldn't even process what he was telling me in that moment. I remember that I genuinely wondered whether God had brought me this far for this moment only to be my last. And I tell you that story 
because I believe I can empathise with the women who were watching and waiting at Jesus' tomb at the end of that terrible day. That Sabbath Saturday must have felt like the longest 24-hour period in history. And I wonder how they held to their resolve to wait and see what happened next. I wonder how often they had to repeat the name of Jesus and the promises of Jesus that he'd spoken while he was with them in order to remain faithful in this time of uncertainty and keep trusting when it seemed as though everything was going wrong. I wonder how long you and I would have remained faithfully waiting for the fulfilment of the promise. And I'm here to tell you that there have been many times in the past seven months since the end of our sabbatical where I've been tempted to move away from watching and waiting on the fulfilment of God's promises to me and my family about our future and just begin to solve my problems in my human strength. Because I wonder, will the wait be worth it? And then I read Matthew 28. And it says, Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone and sat on it. His face shone like lightning and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the women. Don't be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Suddenly, in one moment, everything changed. Was it worth the wait? Of course it was, because that's the moment where everything changed throughout all of history to make a way for us to believe and hold with faith and trust on the promises of God. I'm still waiting for my suddenly. And I'm here for everybody in our room today who's also still waiting for a suddenly in their lives. I'm here to hopefully bring some encouragement and bring my faith to the room as our faith together rises to continue to believe for ourselves and each other that suddenly in one moment, God can shift everything. And often it's going to look like an earthquake or a storm. And yet God is moving. He's fulfilling the promise. So today is a great day to respond. We're going to sing again in a moment about Christ being our firm foundation. I've been holding on to that song. It makes me cry most times. I sing it because it says, I've still got joy in chaos. Do I? I've got peace that makes no sense. I won't be going under God. Where are you? I'm not held by my own strength. I don't need to sing the whole song. We're going to sing it together and it'll sound nicer than that. But I want to make room today for you to respond. Because if you're waiting for a sudden move of God, today is your day. Are you waiting for the fulfilment of a promise like I am? Are you waiting for a restoration of a situation that's broken and you know that a risen Saviour means that that restoration is now possible? Whatever you're waiting for, if there's a suddenly in your life, we're just going to take these few minutes while we're singing this song to pray with you, lend our faith to yours. You know, I've got so many other minister and mentor friends who've been asking to pray with me over this whole situation these past few months. And every single time somebody offers, I say, yes, please. I need your help. I need your faith added to mine because my faith might be low today, but I know that your faith is high and that's why God has given us each other so that we can lend our faith to each other to keep believing. Remain faithfully watching and waiting. Keep our trust in Him. Keep our hearts open that He 
will do what He has said He will do. And suddenly maybe just around the corner if we don't stop now. Why don't you stand to your feet? The team is going to start to sing. And if you want to respond this morning, now's your moment. Come forward and we're going to pray for you. Now's the time. The rock on which I stand.